In this video, we're going to talk about uh, diffusion and osmosis and other ways in which materials get into and out of our cells. If you're watching this video, there's a good chance you're breathing. At least I hope you are. And if you're breathing, you've got oxygen moving from the air into your red blood cells, and you've got carbon dioxide leaving your body, going into the air. So why does that happen? Why does oxygen enter your cells? It has to do with a difference in concentration between the oxygen levels in the air and the oxygen levels in your blood. The concentration of oxygen in the air is higher and it flows from higher to lower concentration and that's called diffusion. <clears throat> the carbon dioxide in your blood when it gets to your lungs is in a higher concentration than the carbon dioxide in the air. And so the carbon dioxide flows out of your blood and into the air. Yeah, and this is the way a lot of materials move back and forth across your cell membrane. It's called diffusion. It doesn't require any energy, and it's just simply moving from high to low concentration. Uh, a good analogy is if you had a beaker of water, and in the bottom you had a, a sugar cube that's been dyed a different color. I should probably use a different color, but it doesn't really matter. Over time, those molecules of dyed particles are going to spread out throughout the beaker, and more or less evenly distributed. That's diffusion. And if we let's try to draw a little cluster of alveoli. These are the little air sacs in your lungs. And these are connected to capillaries, which are going to carry the blood back to your body. And so the O2 concentration is higher outside than inside the cells. It's going to diffuse in. And the CO2 is going to diffuse out. Osmosis is the same process, except it's dealing specifically with water. So it's the diffusion of water. And uh, the osmotic pressure refers to the pressure that develops as a result of osmosis. So to give you an example, let's say we have a cell. And let's say the salt, the, the cell has a salt concentration of 0.1%. And let's say outside the cell, there's a salt concentration of 0.2%. So clearly there's more salt outside the cell. Well, we would say that this is a hypertonic solution. Tonic refers to concentration. Hyper means more than or higher. And so just remember, this is referring to the salt. So if outside, if the solution outside the cell is hypertonic, then we would say that the inside of the cell is hypotonic. Hypo means lower. Now, try to... <clears throat> Think of the water concentration outside the cell. It's a little bit strange to talk about the concentration of water because usually when we say the word concentration, we're talking about something that's dissolved in water. But let's just pretend that water can have a concentration too. So if we have more salt outside, then that would mean we would have less water outside. Right? It's a mixture of salt and water. So as the salt goes up, the water concentration must go down. So we have a lower water concentration outside the cell and a higher water concentration inside the cell. I don't have space to draw it in here, but the higher water concentration inside the cell. So which way is water going to flow due to osmosis? 
Well, water is going to flow from high to low concentration. The water is going to leave the cell. Now, what's that going to do to the cell? Well, if it loses too much water, it's going to shrivel up. Okay, now remember, the reason that the cells shrivel up, really it's because we have more salt outside the cell. And this is the same reason why if you put salt on slugs, it kills them. Because it draws the water out of their cells. So here's a couple terms we looked at already. Hypertonic means a higher solute concentration. Hypotonic is a lower solute concentration. And iso means same. So same concentration inside and outside of the cell. Now just a couple terms you might not know if you haven't taken chemistry is solute and solvent. Okay, when we're talking about the solute, we're talking about something dissolved in something else. So if you have a if you have a solution, a solution of something, it's a mixture of something. And in that mixture, the thing that you have the most of is called the solvent. In most cases, water is the solvent. And the thing that's mixed in with the water that you have less of is called the solute. Osmosis in animal and plant cells. Okay, well, uh, in two slides ago, we looked at what happens to an animal cell when it's placed in a, a solution that's hypertonic. You saw that it shriveled up. Let's take a look and see what happens if you put it in a hypotonic solution. So if the solution is hypotonic, that means it's going to have a lower concentration of solute. Square brackets means concentration. Okay, so low concentration of solute. So you can think then that the water concentration would be higher outside than inside. So which way is the water going to flow? It's going to flow from high to low into the cell. And what might that do to the cell? Well, it's going to get bigger and bigger and it might end up bursting. And by the way, two slides ago when we looked at an animal cell shriveling up, there's a fancy word for that shriveled up animal cell. It's called crenation. So you'd say that the cell has crenated. And then if you look at a plant cell, the plant cells are a little different because as you know they have a cell wall around them. So if you put that in a hypotonic solution, one thing that plant cells have in the middle is a great big vacuole for storing water. So this vacuole is going to absorb lots and lots of water and it's going to cause the cytoplasm to exert pressure on the inside of the cell wall. And that's called trigger pressure. And that's what keeps the cell nice and rigid. And this is why when you water plants they stand up straight. But if you don't water the plants, or if you put the plants in a hypertonic solution, they're going to lose water. Oh, by the way, in this case, in the plant cell, it's not going to burst. Because even though the vacuole can fill up and exert pressure, plant cells have a cell wall, and the cell wall, cell wall will protect it from bursting. And when it shrivels up, what's going to happen is the cytoplasm is actually going to pull away or break away from the cell wall. The vacuole is going to be smaller. And uh, this is called uh, plasmolysis, 
lysis means splitting or breaking. So in this case, the, cyto the cytoplasm or the cell mem and the cell membrane is breaking away. The plasma membrane is breaking away from the cell wall. Permeability of the plasma membrane. So if we just sketch out our phospholipid bilayer, which we looked at in a previous video, very few molecules can diffuse directly across the plasma membrane. Uh, very small molecules like oxygen or CO2 might be able to, but many molecules or ions need special carrier proteins to help them across. So these carrier proteins are going to be integral proteins, which span the entire bilayer, and they will combine with the molecule or ion to help it across. Whoops. <laughs> uh, we need those for facilitated transport and for active transport. Uh, facilitated transport is uh, similar to diffusion in that it doesn't require energy, but it does require a carrier protein. So it might be something like if we have this uh, protein that's kind of closed at one end and opened at one end like this, okay, and when the molecule moves in, it causes a change in shape. It causes this protein to change its shape and open up at the bottom and allow the molecule to enter the cell. Now just the molecule being in there and interacting with the protein is going to cause it to open up. It doesn't actually require any energy. <clears throat> so it's, it's called facilitated because it's, the protein is needed to facilitate that transport. Um, as long as it's working with the concentration gradient, it won't require energy in its facilitated transport. If, however, the molecules are need to move against the concentration gradient, then that does require energy, and that's called active transport. Uh, here's an illustration that's a little bit better than my drawing. You can see these molecules moving into the carrier proteins, causing them to change shape. Okay, and just to highlight again, energy is not required. And it's pointing out here that these small molecules doing this are not lipid soluble. That means they don't dissolve in lipids. And that's significant because that's the cell membrane is made of phospholipids. And so if they were lipid soluble, they would be able to move through the plasma membrane. Okay, active transport, as we mentioned before, does require energy. And that could be because the molecules are moving against the concentration gradient. The molecules are combining with carrier proteins to do that. And it's pointing out also that these are smaller molecules that do this. For larger molecules, it's an entirely different process, which we'll look at in a minute. So here's an example of active transport. This is called uh, a pump or an ion pump. <clears throat> Um, it's requiring energy, and when we say something requires energy, what we're really saying is it needs ATP. ATP is the molecule that is the energy currency of the cell. So here comes ATP, and you don't need to know what that means, but it might actually be helpful in this case. It's adenosine triphosphate, so three phosphates. Each of these blue parts represents a phosphate. And that comes along over here, and one of the phosphate groups breaks off. And so now, instead of adenosine triphosphate, it would be adenosine diphosphate. 
and here's the, the lone phosphate. Okay, and that process uh, releases energy, which is what powers this sodium potassium pump. And we'll talk more about this when we study the nervous system. Okay, finally, for larger molecules that don't fit in a carrier molecule or that don't diffuse directly across the plasma membrane, <clears throat> we have quite a different process. We need these large molecules to be shipped out or in inside of a vesicle. Okay, vesicles um, are formed uh, by the Golgi apparatus. This requires energy. And so first we'll look at exocytosis. You might be able to break this down and figure out what it means. Exo means the outside and cyto refers to the cell. So these are molecules leaving the cell. So here's an example. Here's some material that's going to be secreted. Hey, maybe it's a hormone or maybe it's an enzyme that's been manufactured in the cell. It needs to be secreted. It's going to be packaged up in a vesicle from the Golgi and this vesicle is going to fuse with the plasma membrane and it's going to expel the contents out into this extracellular space where eventually it'll end up uh, you know possibly in your bloodstream okay so that's exocytosis endocytosis is in, in the opposite direction where we have larger materials entering the cell and this is also with vesicles. These vesicles break off of the plasma membrane. <clears throat> and this could be done for a variety of reasons. Uh, it could be for food, for the cell. So here's a, something that the cell is going to eat. Okay, and this prefix phago refers to food. So phagocytosis would be the cell making a vesicle and uh, engulfing this food particle. Okay, also um, pinocytosis, <clears throat> similar process, but it is for fluids. And receptor-mediated endocytosis is uh, also a similar process, except in order for the particles to be engulfed by the cell, they need to first bind with a specific receptor. So endocytosis, again, there's three types, the phagocytosis for eating, the pinocytosis for uh, liquids and fluids dissolved in a liquid, or sorry, small particles dissolved in a liquid, and uh, receptor-mediated endocytosis.